Thank you, Vic. I was thinking, uh, as the last speaker, that I might have been preempted by all of the earlier speakers. Um, and in fact, Jim just used one of my quotes, uh, which is that Piketty, on many occasions in the book, says that politics matters. And what I want to look at in my talk is, well, what does he do with politics? How does he use politics in the argument? Jim put up one quote on his slide um, about why, how Piketty says politics matters. Let me give you another one. Uh, Piketty says that macro-social par parameters of savings and growth, which determine the ratio between capital and labour, I quote, depend on millions of individual decisions influenced by any number of social, economic, cultural, psychological and demographic factors and may vary considerably from period to period and country to country. So he, he wants us to look at all of these wider forces uh, beyond, beyond politics. In another review, decided to yet another review, Duncan Kelly, uh, who is in the politics department at Cambridge, says that one of the themes in Piketty's book is not so much about inequality as a story about the limits of modern democratic politics. Is it possible to act? Now, despite the ambition of Piketty to talk about these political processes, um, he gives very little e explanation of why inequality was politically allowed to come about. And I think he veers between three views in the book. One is that if only we were to read excellent books explaining why inequality is a bad thing, like Piketty's book, then we would perhaps have the will to, to act. In other words, ideas, as in Keynes, would lead to action. On the other hand, sometimes he's very pessimistic. He says political action is very difficult because the class against whom we might now be acting are not able to be artistically and politically represented like the robber barons of the late 19th century. So it's very difficult for a playwright or a novelist or a political agitator to uh, make the class visible. But on other occasions, he, he expresses a fear, or um, perhaps it's a wish, that if the continuation of tax competition continues, there will be political upheaval by undermining the meritocratic hope upon which democratic societies rely. And at the end of the book, I'm not quite sure which one he actually believes. One of the problems is that political processes in the book are under-theorised. And he spends most of the time on the economics, which my colleagues have talked about. And I think that in the book, the, the, the economic processes are, are two, twofold. One is the rev revival of inherited wealth, and it's, that's the RG uh, um, relationship, which we've heard about. And the second one, which nobody has yet mentioned, is the new phenomenon of super managers, individuals who are paid very high salaries big corporations, <coughs> especially in the United States and Britain, and he says that these people are able to get very high salaries because it is very difficult to measure the productivity of a top manager in a large corporation, and the remuneration of those top managers is fixed by other top managers who have a vested interest in them getting a high salary. You can't actually measure, in fact, whether or not that high salary then leads to the success or failure of the firm. I'll come back to, to these, these points uh, in, in a moment. If we're looking at the way in which he analyses politics, I think politics at two periods are critical in his book. The first one, as Jim mentioned, is the First World War, Second World War, and the Depression of the 1930s. And he says that these are <coughs> a shock which leads to policies being adopted. But he never looks at the way in which war is itself a political process. It comes out from outside the system. He calls it an accident, an accidental event. So he doesn't analyse it. And he doesn't then analyse the political responses of different societies to that shock about why some societies might have different tax systems or whatever at the end of the war. But what he does say is that the top rate of income tax moves up under Roosevelt after the shock of the Great Depression from 25% to 80%, similar rise in a state's duty inheritance tax to 70 to 80% in the United States, same in Britain 
much higher levels of redistributive income and inheritance tax than in France and Britain. So that's the first way in which uh, you have an incursion of politics. Accidental, shock, not analysed. The second appearance, which is the one I'm going to focus upon, is the 1970s. As, as Jim said, it's since the 1970s that things have changed, and the argument really hangs upon that. Now, it doesn't, I think, argue that the appearance of political change in the 70s is chaos or accident. It does say this. The resurgence of inequality after 1980 is due largely to the political shifts of the past several decades, especially in regard to taxation and finance. So politics is absolutely important there. The United States rate of taxation, which had been higher than anywhere else, comes down to being 35%, which is below France and Germany, uh, and the same sort of trend uh, occurs in Britain. So he says, there must here be, and I quote, institutional and political differences playing a key role. But what does he say about this? How does it play a key role? And I think that one has to search very hard in the book to understand uh, what the key role of politics might be. Let me look uh, quickly at two areas in which when we might try and tease some of this out. Super managers paying themselves very high salaries in Britain and the United States, and the marked change, secondly, in attitudes to progressive taxation and inequality, which it seems to suggest are leading to some of the growth of inequality. So let's look at super managers, first of all. So Piketty says that the super managers paying themselves gross salaries uh, is largely an Anglo-Saxon phenomenon. So institutional differences must make a difference, although he doesn't actually explain very much about those institutional differences. I think his explanation of why the United States and United Kingdom are different from other countries is weak. First of all, he says, each society has different norms which affect the views of managers, stockholders, and institutional investors. I quote, these social norms reflect beliefs about the contributions that different individuals make to the firm's output and to economic growth in general. Since uncertainty about these issues is great, it is hardly surprising that perceptions vary from country to country and period to period and are influenced by each country's specific history. The important point it is, is that it is very difficult for any individual firm to go against the prevailing social norms of the country <coughs> in which it operates. It's a circular argument. Where do the norms come from? It doesn't explain why they change. Clearly, they had been different under Roosevelt and the New Deal, different under Reagan. Why did it happen? It doesn't say, it just says that the corporations reflect the norms of society. <coughs> that is no explanation because it doesn't explain what the norms of society are. I think he had, there are two elements, if we were to poke a little bit further and try and find out if he does have an explanation of why norms change, I think he has two elements, possibly. They're just mentioned in passing. First, what he calls the conservative revolution in the United States and Britain in the 1970s and 80s. Why was there a conservative revolution? Why did norms change? Because Britain and the United States feared that they were being overtaken by Japan and Europe. Now, if we were at Jim's talk before lunch about declinism, he would say, well, actually, that's a cultural phenomenon. I think he would anyway. Uh, why do we talk about decline when we're in the top you know, group of wealthy nations? Is it really a, a, a re real phenomenon? So fear of being overtaken is one thing. And the second thing, he argues, is the change in the way in which top salaries were determined. He says, when tax rates were 80%, managers didn't bother about demanding higher salaries because they wouldn't get very much of it. But if the tax rate is down to 35 or 40%, they're going to demand very high salaries because they can spend most of what the additional money they get. Now, based in that is a sort of a set of assumptions about social behaviour, psychological motivations. Is that true or not? And what he also hints at, but doesn't then pick up, 
is that those people who then get very high net increases in their salaries can buy political influence. And he does say that at one point, that these gains from these super managers can then finance political parties and pressure groups, and this might be part of his pessimistic interpretation, but he doesn't follow it up. It's a point that Duncan Kelly does follow up. He says that the very affluent have distorting and disproportionate representation effects on mainstream American politics. Affluence buys influence. Now, if that's the case, and you could argue that capital taxation of the type that he is recommending did not happen after the First World War, as I've argued elsewhere, why does he think that what he now wants is a naive policy in, uh, outcome, which is a global wealth tax, is going to happen now, given what he has said? What I would just like to say very briefly is that if we're going to understand why those super managers are paying themselves more, we need to understand why corporations in Britain and the United States took the form they did and had a greater division of ownership from control. And I would there refer to Brian Cheffins's book on corporate ownership and control. And Brian says that there's a greater if like, division of ownership and control in Britain and the United States than in Germany and France because of policy decisions. The policy decisions are taxation, First of all, on the sell side, that the um, inland revenue in this country uh, discouraged private companies because they saw it as a tax evasion strategy. And that led to the development of uh, division of ownership control, diversified portfolios. In other words, it was being driven by institutional factors coming from within the tax collection regime. So in other words, we need to understand the corporate structure in terms of the politics of taxation and compliance. On the buy side, one thing which is clear in this country, perhaps more than in France and Germany, is institutional ownership. And institutional <coughs> ownership can again be understood out of contingent circumstances of 1853 when Glantz introduced tax breaks on life insurance policies. So again, we need to try and understand that. My final three minutes um, is to look at the 1970s. Now, what I would say here is that, again, Piketty does not try to explain very well, in my view, the shift from uh, that acceptance of redistributive progressive taxation to proportionate or non-progressive taxation. Britain is overtake, sorry, Britain and the United States cut their taxes more. Why? Tax competition, he says, and a race to the bottom. But again, if this tax competition is a race to the bottom, why do Britain and the United States win the race? So it doesn't really explain that. And what I've tried to do um, in, in my paper, which is, is on my view rather than Piketty's view, is to say, well, I could think of a large number of reasons why we might find a race to the bottom, why attitudes change. It might be the relationship between who pays income tax uh, and who, uh, 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 at what level and who votes. 1945 to 70, most voters were below the threshold for income tax. Inflation puts more people in. The median voter starts to pay of progressive income tax. That changed the political calculation. The housing issue I was going to mention, the median taxpayer, as Jim has pointed out in his review, is a mortgage, is mortgagee. They're house owners. But house ownership is itself a political construct. It might be, as Avner pointed out some years ago in his book on um, the late 19th century, it could be like the market of Salisbury's, building of a rampart of property owners around big property. So we need to look at that as, again, being a political, political process. So, again, it doesn't look at home ownership as a political uh, construct. Um, I think I could go on further about some of these, these arguments, uh, but I have expanded them at more length in an introduction to a book coming out called Leviathan Against the Boom, which will be available from Cambridge University Press later this year. <laughs> I think that's that... Plug. That's a plug. <laughs> it's blatant. I will conclude by saying that one of the problems about um, Piketty's book, I think, is it's too bloody big. It's not actually going to be marching to the barricades, waving that, because you will get repetitive strain injury. 
the political argument there is dense, it's complicated. I think it's without a clear political message, apart from saying that we want to have a global wealth tax, or if that is utopian, why don't we have a European Union wealth tax, as if that is any more possible. The problem is it hasn't really been taken up in a practical and popular manner it, uh, by politicians who might use it as a way of seizing the initiative from UKIP um, and saying that immigration is a source of all our problems to say, no, it's not, it's inequality is a source of all of our problems. Thank you.